Revelation chapter 1, I want to read to you one verse. It's verse number 7. It reads, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, your coming is upon us. Your word is final and solid, the foundation of which we stand on. Dear Lord, help us to build, help us to build upon the foundation of the Lord and the words. Because in the beginning was the word. Dear Lord, and all things were built on that word. And all things come into life because of it. And dear Lord, there will be a coming day when we will see your face coming through the clouds to take your people home. Help us to be a prepared people, a fervent people for the Lord. Dear Lord, help us to burn bright in darker days. In love and name I pray. Amen. It's going to be heavy in here, folks. I'm going to say that. On Friday night, I had a dream. And when I got up Saturday morning, I knew that it would be the foundation of this message. <laughs> the things that we're going to discuss this morning, they're not, uh, they're not anything new. In fact, they're not anything deep. Neither are they theologically impressive. Uh, however, the content of this word should at least spark some excitement and alarm within the hearts of anybody that's looking for the coming of the Lord. So I'm going to read to you 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you a lot of it, starting at verse number 3. And I want you to hear the words of what the Apostle Peter had to say. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3, says, Knowing this verse, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? I hear that in the church well, man. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, what did you just say? It's a mistake. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water in the water, whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished with the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, Wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. I want you to look at society right now. Tell me what you see. And I've got a reason for this message, man. When you look at men and women's lives right now, do you not see a hardness that's beginning to overtake the people? Do you not see the traits that Peter spoke of taking place in the world right now? Beyond that, if we were honest, even infiltrating the church in America. Do we not see that there's an increase of wickedness that's overtaking right now 
the hearts of man in such a way that it's seemingly hardened people to the truth of Jesus Christ? Have they not heard and heard and heard, but yet by choice they're willingly ignorant of the light that could deliver them from their darkness? The book of Revelation says on a few different occasions that men, when they're facing judgment in the end times, rather than repent, they would blaspheme God and refuse to turn from their uncleanness. And I'm telling you, man, that right now that time has come. That any level of plague or any level of remedial judgment or any level of anything that's going on in the earth right now should cause anybody in their right mind to turn unto the Lord and put away their sin and look unto Him for salvation and life. But right now we're living in a generation and it's a fact that you look upon people, you look upon their faces, you hear their words and their, you see their actions. And right now, rather than turn, they shake a fist at God and blame God for all of their despair and problems and turn further from the one that could give them life. When men boast in their pride about their sin and challenge God or his people to do anything about it, I'm telling you, I can assure you that the end is upon us. Amen. I don't know if y'all are hearing me right now. There was a couple of decades ago when men and women could come by the thousands on a regular basis because their hearts were soft enough to receive the word of God and they would come and they would be saved. But right now you see it very seldom except in remote places where the gospel is trampled upon like it is in America. You don't see it that much anymore now. Why do you suppose that is? I'll read to you Matthew 24, 14 and then move on. It says in the gospel of the kingdom. This shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Amen. And then shall the end come. Right. Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. But we're going to tell you, it's just a fact of a dying generation. As the warnings increase, then the listeners decrease. And as the love of many wax cold in this hour, it's like glazed over eyes. The souls of men are overcome by their iniquity in this hour and their surfeiting, as the Bible would say, in this hour. And therefore they perish with the world that they so dearly love. If you don't think it's a big deal and you're clear because you're saved, I want you to rethink that because look around you right now. I promise you there's people that will sometimes be in this house that right now are not qualified by the means of faith in Jesus Christ to actually go when the Lord comes. Amen. There's people that will sit among us even now if we can get them to come back in the door that are not ready for the Lord when he comes. What if some of us aren't ready when the Lord comes? Luke 21, 33 says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of life, and so that they come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall come on all of them that dwell on the face of the whole earth, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all things that shall come to pass in this world that you might stand before the Son of Man. Amen. First Thessalonians 5. I won't let the book be the most speaking. Starting at verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come up upon them and travail upon as a woman with child and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. I'm going to tell you right now, and I'm not here to, to build your pre-trib theology and to give you comfort at a time where you really should not be comfortable. 
It might be pre-trib, but I'm not going to debate the timing of anything with you right now because this has nothing to do with the timing of the catching away. Everything to do with the fact that you do not want to miss that moment. Amen. You do not want to find yourselves unprepared when that time comes. When the Lord calls his faithful people out of the world and unto himself, I can assure you, that you're going to want to be a part of that group on that blessed day. You do not want to get left out. Amen. And Jesus said one more time, pray always that you be counted worthy to escape all things that shall come to pass in this world, that you might stand before the Son of Man. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now that this has nothing to do with the timing of that blessed day and everything to do with an urgency that I ask that you consider what time it is and be prepared in your hearts and prepare those around you for the things that are coming. I've been telling you for three years until I'm blowing my face that America's going down the tank. It's going to happen. And when there was two years left, I told you America was going to down the tank and there's nothing that's going to change it. And now in 2020, when things happen, people see change, but they assume that it's going to be corrected. And I'm telling you, it's not going to be corrected. And then now here we are at the forefront of economic collapse. I'm telling you, man, the Great Depression is going to look like a joke compared to what's fixed to come against the U.S. of A. under the judgment of God. Amen. It's the judgment of God. Do you hear me? Amen. This isn't by mistake, man. I've got teenagers right now that are going to have to live in this world under the judgment hand of the Lord unless they too repent and return to the hill and walk in righteousness. grain of sand falls to the bottom of God's eternal end time hourglass. Where are you going to be? Do you think it matters? The vain pursuits with your friends in school? Now, I promise you that don't matter. You think what they think about your clothes and what they think about you matters? I promise you they're the one that matters and what he thinks of you matters. I spent my life in foolishness. I hurt too many people. I've done too many things wrong to even recall. And I am thankful by the grace of God that he had pulled me out of the mire and set me upon the rock of Christ. It hurts to watch people running full speed toward hell. Amen. While not listening or considering how does somebody that rotten become like this overnight unless there really is a God. I'm telling you, man, there's no redos. There's no going back. Your opportunity to make an amends or to ask for forgiveness is well gone. It's too late. There's no more chances to say I love you and no more chances to say I'm sorry. It's over. First Peter chapter five, verse four says, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Colossians three, starting at four says, We're about to see a house of cards. This once great nation with the foe, man. I don't want that. How could I want that with that many kids? If it's just me, it might be different, but how could I want that? I'm telling you, call me a fool for another three years, but watch and see if it don't happen. When your gas is $9 a gallon, maybe that won't sound so crazy. Colossians 3, who, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Let's not stop there. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. 
For which things sake the wrath of God come upon the children of disobedience. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Folks, I can give it my best shot to giving you leadership and to help you and to guide you, but I cannot mortify your members or ensure that you're living soberly in this present world. I can produce a message and get with God and write down what he shows me and come and preach it and do the best that I can at that, but I cannot create in your heart a passion for holiness, and I cannot put within your heart a desire to live godly before the Lord Jesus Christ. I cannot do that. The Spirit of the Lord over the last two days has been setting a greater urgency within my heart than there already was. And you know me, there's already an urgency. I'm already watching. I'm already waiting. But God showed me something in a dream I've not been the same for the last 48 hours. And I'm going to tell you right now that you do not want to play games with the timing of where we are. My question to the church is very simple, and I ask that you hear me very closely. Have you made yourselves ready? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you ready this morning? Is your lamp burning with the oil of the Holy Ghost? Are you ready? For as the lightning flashes out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And when he comes, I'm telling you, it'll be on the backside of the shout and the voice of an archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord of the air if they're ready. Amen. I don't want you to not go. I don't want you to not be ready because the cares of the world have the, a way about slowing you down and the way in you with burdens and causing you to not press on with the same fervency and the same zeal that you once had. That's the, that's the way it is in the end times. Some people fall away and they never get up. Others, they barely get by. You have yet a little strength, says the Lord. Take what you have and strengthen that. Watch what you have. Make sure nobody takes your crown. You're living in a time in which you're not going to make it unless you're going to intentionally make it. Amen. You're not going to coast through this thing and it just happened. Just because you heard the greatest name that's above every other name and you were made to sit in a house of God because your family dragged you down there does not qualify you for salvation, either eternal life. And if you think the gospel is cheap, how cheap does that cross look unto you? When they put a twisted thorns around his face and they beat the one and only one that can live without sin. And they drove the snakes into his ankles and to his wrist. And they mocked him and they spit in his face and you couldn't recognize him anymore. Do you think that's cheap to God? I'm going to tell you as the church lives as if it's cheap and we trample underfoot the Son of God. We're coming under a day in which we're going to have to think about how we've lived for the Lord. Amen. And right now, this message is not to be hard. It's to awaken the church to say, take self-inventory right now before it's too late because the Lord is coming quickly. His reward is with him to give to every man according as his work shall be. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Amen. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. In Daniel chapter 12, it said there will be a time of trouble. And I'm telling you, that time is right here now. Not a decade from now, it's now. It's now. I stake it all, man. I've read and I've read and I've read and I've read and I've read. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. I'm telling you, we're here. But 
I say here, I don't know if it's a year or two, but I know it's now. Within a realm of a short time, it's now. There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even right. to that same time. In that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I'm telling you right now, man, that our nation is coming under judgment and is coming under real judgment this time. Amen. By the grace and the mercy of God that endures forever, remedial judgments have sought to get our attention over and over again. At a time, God will do a little here and a little there, hoping to wake up the people to go about the process in the way that he always does. And it's a lengthy, lengthy measure of mercy in which God tries to awaken a people that are not given attention to what time it is. And then finally, those remedial judgments become something far more severe. Right now, we are facing the far more severe, even now, as of 2022. Mark my words, you are looking at the very worst year that you've ever seen in the entire time you've been alive. And it's fixing to happen from 2021 now to 2022 in October. You watch, you're fixing to see a shaking that will cause your jaw to drop to the ground if it is that you don't know what is written. And if you don't know who you've believed and who you've trusted in, you will not be ready for that day. If you are not found and solid upon the one who has saved you, who is the rock of ages, the ancient of days, you will not be found ready. You will be found wanting. We are living in the last days right now, and I'm going to tell you, America is fixing to feel it in such a way. Can you not see it? Maybe everything's unfolding too slow for people to actually take God seriously, but I want to read to you Ecclesiastes chapter 11, chapter 8, verse 11, and it says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's where we are. People say if God was going to do something, he'd do it. Look at all the mess here. He's not doing anything about it. He don't care what I do. He don't care about the abortions. He don't care about the wickedness. He don't care about the dope. He don't care about the adultery. He don't care about none of that. We'll press on to what we do, and God will never do anything. And I'm telling you, God will, and he shall, and it's coming now. Right. Amen. Isaiah 66 says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire. And with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh. The slain of the Lord shall be many. What would he do? He will plead with all flesh. Please turn. This is the result of the holiness of God. I must do what I'm doing, but I'm pleading with you through drastic measures. Please repent and turn to the Lord. I don't know what else to tell you. Maybe if I preached it a little better and gave you just the right verse, you would believe and understand. But my fear is that many will rise from their seat and walk out the door and go about their business just like normal. The end of all things is upon us right now. Jesus Christ is at the door. And before you know it, the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And you'll see the man, the son of man, coming in the clouds with great glory and great power. And as these things begin to come to pass, if you've been made ready, then look up and lift up your eyes for your redemption draweth nigh. But if you are not ready, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I urge you right now to search your heart, search your life, and make good and sure you are ready. Use that word in your mind, that imagination. Think about it. How many people do you think are going to say, I thought I had more time? I thought for sure I'd get this put away first. Matthew 24, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Philippians 3, circa 20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. because I can't put you in my head and give you my eyes. In the dream, I was what appeared to be downtown. It looked like I was on State Street. But there was a coldness in the atmosphere. And when I say coldness, I don't mean in temperature, I mean in spirit. Everything was just felt dead. Everything just felt dark. I didn't see commotion. I didn't see people really doing much. It seemed as though something had already happened. I thought to myself, where are all the people? What's going on around here? This place seems to be entirely lifeless. Then I realized I'm by myself at this moment. Where's my family? And then it's like something spoke to me and I realized that God had taken them. And I began to look and I began to consider, but I gave up quickly knowing that it was for sure that God took them. No need to look. I know what's happened here. And there I was. They were gone and it was just me. And I thought the hour is dark. Everything is terrible looking. It looks kind of like a war zone. Nothing feels right. The love is gone. There's no joy. There's no peace. It's just dead. My family's gone. God has taken them. And I realized, I'm like, God, you didn't take me. And in that moment, I found myself broken down and upset. I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. My family's gone. The Lord didn't take me. It's too late. It's, it's gone. And then I envisioned myself in this sense here, bowed down, upset, and broken. When I saw one like unto the Son of Man. Who came to me and put his hand on my back and then took the other arm and wrapped it around me and then I flew. <laughs> and as I was flying, I could remember my thoughts. I was thinking it was just that you did not take me. I understand why you did not take me. And I knew in that moment that God was showing me what it should be like, that I did not deserve to go, that I've been wretched even as a preacher, that I've been miserable, and I had no business going in the flight with the rest of the worthy. But God came unto me, and he said, but you are my son, and I'm not leaving you behind. I've never left one behind. And he took me, and I flew because of the grace of God. And I'm going to tell you this, I didn't deserve it. I had no business flying, but the Lord came, and in his goodness, he took me, and I went to. But what I realized in all of that was simple. Make sure your house is in order. Because there's coming a day in which many will fly. He will gather them unto himself. And if they go and you're still there, you're going to feel it. And you're going to know that it's too late. The goodness of God in this case. It was God. It was intentional. What God showed me was intentional. That I waited for your sake so you would know what you deserve. But I've never from day one ever given you what you deserve. So here I am as your father. I've never left one behind. No man left behind. That's my policy. 
And I've come and I've seen now that you understand what you deserve and where you belong. And I'm going to hold you and I'm going to take you with me. I'm not leaving you behind. I'm not abandoning you. But I want to tell you as the church understand and know this. I didn't deserve to go. I didn't live for God in the way that I should have. I didn't steward well this platform. I didn't steward well my family. I didn't steward well my finances. I didn't always talk to that person the way that I needed to. And God wanted me to know through that dream that you're treading on thin ice. I'm not leaving you, but if you don't watch it, you're going to see some things come to pass that you don't want to miss. That's what he was saying. You don't want to miss this, but if you don't shape up, you may not go, son. I know where I stand. I know what my walk with God looks like. I know what my prayer life looks like. What does yours look like? And when you enter into the heavenlies, and you finally see him face to face, you stand before the beam of seat of Christ, and he renders unto you whatever it is that's fitting, whether good or evil, what will your lot be? Everything in this world that passes away, it no longer matters in that moment. There's nobody that's escaping the day of judgment. The Lord's coming quickly, man. I'm telling you, I don't care where your life is. I don't care what your priorities are. What you think is most important and what you've done with this gospel. How you've treated or not treated this Jesus. None of that matters once it's all said and done. What matters is that now you're doing with it what you should be doing with it. I don't want y'all to live like fools, but I'm going to show you what else God showed me. That the goodness of God is so great. It's so abounding. And I heard the Lord speak to me the most ridiculous thing ever because I didn't deserve to go. I had no business going there. I should have been left behind. It was just. I couldn't argue that with God. He said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. That's not saying I'm putting you in front of everybody else. That's saying, look, everybody, when they belong to me, shall be blessed. You look into me, and you trust in me, and I will never fail you. I will never let you down. Don't go through this world walking alongside of nobody else but me. Don't pass through this world forgetting the one that's redeemed you and forgetting how good he is and neglecting him when it comes time to commune and to pray. Don't go through this world as one that's living as a fool in this carnal, drunken, with the sin bent backslid nation world do not get caught up in that group I don't know how to plead with you anymore because if, if you don't hear my pleadings from this microphone the next thing are the pleadings of the fiery sword of the Lord and I don't want anybody to be in the earth when that comes to pass Amen. you will not escape all measure of tribulations and trials but you are not appointed unto wrath says the Lord I want to encourage you right now. I don't know how else to say it. I don't know what else to do. Get your house in order. Be ready because America's coming under judgment. You live here. And if you ain't got your house right, then some problems are coming your way. The Lord says, come up hither. We'll be going to a land where there's no more death. No more graves. No more funeral homes. Who we go to a place where there's no more grieving, no more separation, no more loss. A place where you don't read any more obituaries and you don't bury any more friends. Is anybody here? He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. There I was, left behind. When the one who promised me, the master builder who started the work, scooped me up himself. The vision I had of the marriage supper of the Lamb years ago 
when I walked in and the Lord said, you made it, son. I've told you that that was speaking to me that I wasn't so sure that I would. And now here I am with yet another visionary type dream in which I didn't really make it, but I made it. I don't want to say by the skin of my teeth, but by the fullness of the grace of God. At every occasion that I've had a catching away dream or an end time dream, I, if I go back and I assess them all, I see that I was never worthy and never fit for it. But yet I made it. What does that say? When I got saved, God delivered me from my sin and he stretched out a hand to a disobedient, obstinate man and he was good to me when he could have been everything but good to me. It was very difficult for me not to serve him at that point. And he's not changed. When it comes down to every other issue, he's still that good. Yes, and I fear that the church has forgotten how good he is and we failed to serve him and give him our life in the way that he deserves. I don't believe God is trying to threaten people with getting left behind. I believe God is trying to awaken people to return to their first love and serve him like you did the very first day you got saved. Return to your first works. Whatever it's going to take. of the earth shall well because of him. 
even so, 